So, session two. Um, I feel a lot of pressure on me because of how built up it was from the first one. I feel like I have a lot to cover, but no, um, I think uh, just praying the Lord will, uh, will guide me in this and then make this useful for you guys. I really hope to. I don't know. It's just you guys. What? Now, you standing up, though, makes me nervous. Find your seat. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm really thankful uh, for the amount of, gra- of, uh, of ground that my dad was able to cover just to uh, get talking about all those weak points to look for in the unbelieving worldview, all those inconsistencies, the arbitrariness, all those fallacies that we want to be aware of. And I think he did, um, very thankful for him, did a fine job bringing that out. But my goal here is to kind of put some meat on all of that and show you guys how that actually translates into real life conversations when we are, you know, talking with our unbelieving friends and family. Um, Because you'd be surprised like how it's easy when we're here today and it's us, we're looking at examples and we can kind of point things out and say, okay, I see that they're being inconsistent. I see that that doesn't make sense. But when you're actually having a conversation with somebody who's not a Christian, who's bringing up real objections in real time, you can very easily get thrown off your game, get distracted. um, And we need to know how to respond. So I really, our goal here is to equip you guys so you feel confident in going out, sharing the gospel. Like we said, this is, it goes along with evangelism. And so hopefully today I can kind of equip you guys for some of the questions we'll be facing and to do it biblically. Because the Bible actually does lay out for us an approach in interacting with unbelievers and especially doing apologetics in Proverbs uh, 26, verses 4 and 5. You guys probably know this verse. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, just to point out, when the Bible is talking about a fool here, it doesn't mean somebody who's unintelligent, somebody who's just like an idiot. A fool is anybody who denies God, who does not believe in God, who doesn't believe in Christ. In uh, Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. But it says there, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then also in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what what this passage means when it's talking about a fool is all unbelievers. Anybody who would deny God, who would deny his existence, who would deny Jesus Christ, the Bible regards that person as a fool. And that's because it's not being mean. It's not calling them names. But that's because they're denying God, who's actually the source of all knowledge. Kind of like what we talked about in that last session. God is the source and the foundation of all knowledge. And when they deny God, they're denying true knowledge in their hearts it shows that they hate true wisdom. And so this passage in Proverbs 26, it's not a contradiction saying, don't answer a fool, just kidding, answer them. What it's doing is laying out for us two steps in how we as Christians deal with unbelievers and how we go about doing apologetics. And I really want to make sure that we do this because just like we talked about earlier, everyone does apologetics. Either you're going to do a really great job, a decent job, or a bad job. And I really pray and hope that all of us are striving to do the best, most biblical job we can do when defending the faith. Um, So let's turn right to it. First step in doing apologetics. I don't know what my slides are. So uh, first step in doing apologetics, don't answer the fool according to his folly. Throughout all of scripture, but especially in the book of Proverbs, if if you read Proverbs, the Bible has a whole lot to say about the fool. For one thing, It says the fool hates knowledge. They won't be corrected. They speak out of anger. They're not discerning. They love to talk and don't listen. Those things are characteristic of the person the Bible calls a fool. And so when we're told not to answer a fool according to his folly, one thing that means is we don't take on those tactics. When we are in a conversation, we don't, we don't mirror their attitude or their way of thinking. So how many times have you guys experienced, I know a lot of you guys in here for sure, and probably all of you, if you've ever ever had a conversation with somebody who's not a Christian, how how many times have you experienced somebody just like belittling you, making fun of you, and not taking seriously what you're arguing for? Or somebody getting angry with you and losing their temper because they don't like what you're saying? 
Or if somebody, like we talked about the ad hominem attack, where they attack your character, or they attack your personality, instead of actually going after your argument, they attack you as a person. See, those things are characteristic of the fool. It's a non-Christian, unbiblical attitude. And as Christians, we don't argue in this way. Just to put it very bluntly, we don't stoop down to that level. And we saw this uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, the, uh, the end part of that verse. I don't have it because we looked at it earlier. But 1 Peter 3.15, remember the end part of that verse. It says to correct our opponents with gentleness and respect. When we defend the faith, we do it lovingly, respectfully, and gently. We don't attack their character. We don't insult their intelligence. We're not, uh, we don't lose our temper on them. We listen to what they're saying, and we, uh, we defend our position, and we call for them to do the same. But even more importantly than this, when Proverbs tells us not to answer a fool according to their folly, it tells us um, that we don't want to take on their presuppositions, their worldview as our own. Remember, we talked about worldview. We talked about presuppositions. The unbeliever, when they're arguing against us, they assume that the Bible is not true. They assume most of the time that there is no God, that Jesus is not God, whatever it may be. We don't take on that worldview. We don't adopt those presuppositions. Because listen, when we get into a conversation, 99% of the time, they're going to say to us, and you guys have heard it, listen, don't force your religion on me. I don't want to hear it. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't believe the Bible, so don't even bother. And the temptation for us every single time is to give in and say, you know, fine, we'll just leave the Bible out for now. And why do we do that? Because we don't want them to see us as being like some sort of weirdo. We don't want to be like, oh, that Bible thumping fundamentalist, how they portray us. Or we just think that that's the only way to get people to listen to us. That, hey, if I want to actually have a conversation with someone, then I can't use the scriptures. But we cannot give in to that sort of temptation. Because uh, first of all, number one, it's illogical to do that. Think about it. The unbeliever, again, they're arguing the Bible is not true. They're arguing against it. Ultimately, what we're trying to prove is that what's taught in Scripture is the truth. And so it would not make sense for us from the beginning to put away the Scripture, assume basically that it's false, and then somehow try to work our way back and prove to them that the Bible's true. This goes back to what we talked about earlier, no neutrality. There is no neutral ground. They have presuppositions. So do we. And we need to be honest about that. So it's illogical, but even more than that, it's actually unbiblical and disobedient to lay aside scripture when we're doing apologetics. Again, in 1 Peter 3.15, the first thing it says, honor Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so if we truly believe what the Bible teaches when it says the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, if we believe what we read in Colossians, that all knowledge and wisdom is hidden in Christ Jesus, then we will be literally foolish to put away scripture. That's why the Bible says, if we answer the fool according to their folly, if we lay aside our worldview and step into theirs, then we become fools ourselves. All knowledge begins with almighty God. All wisdom and knowledge is in scripture. And we need to be upfront about that and honest about that. And so we cannot lay aside scripture. I want to give you guys an illustration to kind of show you how important this is. Because like I said, we are going to be tempted every single time to put away the Bible. And we have to remember that that's the worst thing we can do to start off this argument. So let me give you this illustration. It's not original to me, but I want you guys to like imagine that you're on a rough, stormy, dangerous ocean. And there's huge waves and wind. And this is like the most deadly kind of ocean you can imagine. And you're in the middle of it, but you're on a ship. And this ship is state-of-the-art. It is airtight. It is armored. It, it's protected against any sort of attack. It cuts right through the waves. Nothing. It's literally unsinkable. Like the Titanic, but like actually unsinkable. Like, this is the only safe place to be. And so you're here, and you're on your ship, and you look off, and you see out in the distance this person rowing towards you. And they're on this little raft, and it's just like a few pieces of wood roped together. It's rotting. It's got holes. It's like barely staying afloat. But they manage to row up to the side of your ship, and they start like throwing rocks at your ship. And they're just saying, hey, your ship is dumb, and you're dumb for being on it, and you need to get off that ship and come here onto my raft. So if you're in that situation, yeah, I know, you laugh. But if you're in that situation, what do you do? 
Are you going to climb down off your ship and get on the little raft and say, hey, listen, you know, this is, a, this is a nice raft you have here, but you should really, you know, my ship actually, it's a really safe place, and I think you might like it. You should really give my ship a chance. No, that's ridiculous. We're going to stay where we are in the safety of our ship, and we're going to cry out to them and say to them, listen, look at what you're standing on. If you don't leave your raft and jump onto my ship, you're going to die that's what we have to do as Christians. We stand on the Christian worldview, the unsinkable Christian worldview, and we point out to the unbeliever that what they're standing on cannot hold water. Pun intended. <laughs> All right. So I hope you guys let that stick with you because I want you guys to, to remember that. Don't, don't abandon the Christian worldview, even though you're going to be tempted to. And so it seems almost like we're in an impasse because we have our worldview and they have their worldview and they have their rescuing devices and we have our rescuing devices and we'll keep trading evidence and it seems as if nothing's going to get done because neither of us are going to give up our presuppositions. And so it's almost like both sides are putting evidence into a scale and even though the weight of the scale is always on the Christian side, the weight of the evidence is always on our side, the unbeliever doesn't see it that way. Their scale is broken. The way they look at it is broken. So no matter what you throw in there, they're always going to see the evidence as being on their side, even if it's not. And so instead of piling more evidence into the scale, we don't want to point out to them that the scale is broken. The way they're looking at the evidence is broken. That's what we want to go after. And so, we, so while we don't have common ground, so to speak, with the, or I'm sorry, while there's no neutral ground with the unbeliever, there is definitely common ground. And we looked at it a little bit in Romans. You guys know the text of Romans 1, where it talks about how, you know, our, uh, the unbeliever's hearts are darkened. They're futile in their thinking. Uh, they're given over to a debased mind. That's all true. But Romans 1 and 2 also teaches us a couple of other things. Uh, verses 19 and 20 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his divine power, uh, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And then Romans 2 says that when Gentiles do, do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So we don't have neutral ground with the unbeliever. However, the unbeliever still lives in God's world and is made in God's image. And no matter how hard they try to suppress those truths, they can't erase them. They can't fully escape them. And so the Bible teaches us, this isn't me saying this, this is the Bible saying this, that every single person, no matter how much they may deny God, knows God in their hearts. And so that's our point of contact with the unbeliever. That's why we can stand on a biblical worldview, make our case from scripture, and then uh, challenge them by asserting, listen, you do know God. And then we show them by some of the stuff that he talked about and that I'm going to continue to talk about. So that's number one. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. But then number two, it says answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So once we're firmly planted on the Christian worldview, once we've made our defense from Scripture primarily, our job then is to show the unbeliever how foolish their worldview really is. Like with the raft, we want to show them what they're standing on. We want to show them that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So what we want to do is to illustrate to the unbeliever what would actually happen if they took their position and were consistent across the board with it. We want to show them that if you actually carried out your worldview consistently, it leads to just uh, absurdity. Kind of like that guy in that video talked about. If you were to be consistent with the girl who wanted to be a cat, then it leads to absurdity or futility. And so what this does, it shows them two things. Number one, it shows them that their worldview is actually self-defeating. That means that it fails by its own standard. So if you were to consistently apply their standard across the board, the worldview fails. It implodes. And then number two, we show them also that the biblical worldview is consistent both with itself and with our experience, what we experience as human beings. And we're going to show them also 
that no unbeliever actually lives consistently with what they say they believe. And in many cases, they borrow from the Christian worldview. They live as if they believed Christianity were true. And so I know that these things, it might sound a little bit abstract. It might sound a little bit philosophical, but I promise you that most, if not all of you guys already do this sort of thing. And so I want to give a few examples of showing you guys um, how we do this in day-to-day -day life and in conversation. Are we good on time? All right. Um, so number one, we're going to start with um, the example of abortion. That's something that pretty much all of us here at Redeemer are familiar with. We talk about that a lot. It's a hot topic for Christians, and there's a lot of opinions out there regarding abortion. Um, I'm sure everybody in here has had conversations with somebody who is supportive of abortion. And what's the argument every time? It's, listen, you can believe what you want to believe. You have a right to your opinion. But at the end of the day, it is the woman's choice. She gets to decide whether or not the child is valuable. It's up to her to decide if and when she wants to start a family. She has to choose what's best for her, her life, her individual. You may not like it. I may not like it, but they have to be, they have to have that choice. It's only right. It's only fair that they have that choice. And therefore abortion has to be legal and available. That's the argument. And again, all of us have been in these conversations. We've heard it. You guys know it. So take a second. When you hear this sort of thing, take a second and think. What are they assuming? What are the presuppositions, the things that they're just taking for granted and not arguing for? So a couple of things. They assume from the outset, number one, that the unborn are not human. The, the, uh, the proponent of abortion assumes that the unborn is not a human person, at least not in a way that's valuable. They'll argue that they're a clump of cells. They're sort of like subhuman or potentially human, but they're not human human. But they don't argue for that. They just assume it. But another thing they assume, they, just, they assume that the, it's the woman who gets to decide the value of what it is she's carrying. And so if there's a pregnant woman and she wants the baby and she's excited about the baby, guess what? You call that baby a baby and her unbelieving friends and people who would support abortion call that baby a baby. But if the woman doesn't want it, won't have it, then all of a sudden that's not a baby anymore. It's not valuable anymore. So it's the woman who gets to decide what it is and whether or not it's valuable. Contrast that with the Christian worldview, where we see that God creates all people in his image, and therefore every human being is valuable. So before you even start, think to yourself, when you're in these conversations, what's this person assuming? What, are they, what do they believe that they're not even arguing for? They also assume another thing, that it's the woman's choice that trumps the value of whatever it is that's inside of her, that no matter how much evidence there is to prove the value of that child in the womb, they assume that the woman's choice still trumps it. That those are the most closely held beliefs for the person who supports abortion. And so they'll tell us over and over again, they'll call on us to put the Bible away. They'll say, listen, forget it. You can't force your religion on me. I don't want to hear what the Bible says. They'll tell us to be neutral. And so we're going to be tempted to go and to use the neutral evidence. And so we'll say, okay, forget the Bible. Let's just talk about uh, the biology that, you know, we can detect a heartbeat very, very early on. We'll talk about how the DNA strands are complete at conception, that the gender is determined, the blood type, all of that is present, the moment of conception. And so therefore those things are, um, therefore those, that, that child is human. Everything necessary is there. And that's great evidence, and it's really important. I know, and we talk about this stuff. We need to know that, and we need to be able to articulate that. But how often do you see people change their position on abortion based on the biological facts? It may happen sometimes, but usually it doesn't. Why? Because their most closely held belief is that the woman gets to decide whether or not that child in the womb is valuable. And so no matter how much evidence you have, that's still their most closely held belief. So we don't want to use the biblical method, the biblical approach when we encounter these proponents of abortion. So number one, don't answer according to their folly. We base our argument primarily on scripture, the biblical presupposition that yes, God and scripture are the authority over all people and God created all mankind in his image and therefore we are intrinsically valuable. 
The Bible teaches us that God knits us together in our mother's womb. That's Psalm 139. Jeremiah 1 tells us that God knows us before he forms us in the womb. In the law of Exodus, chapter 21, there's even legal protection, justice for unborn children, even to the point of the death penalty if somebody causes the death of an unborn child. And so the consistent biblical testimony is, number one, all people are made in God's image. Number two, unborn children are human beings. And so number three, they're valuable and they cannot be murdered. God's law says you shall not murder. And so the consistent testimony of scripture, that's the foundation for what we believe is that abortion is murder and it's sinful and it ought not be tolerated. Now, again, on top of that, we can use all that wonderful, wonderful evidence. Look, the biological evidence, it supports the Christian worldview. It supports the biblical claims, but that's not what we build our argument on. The foundation is scripture. Ultimately, that's why we believe what we believe, because the Bible tells us, the Bible teaches it. But the, absolutely, we want to use the evidence in support of that. So that's number one. Don't answer according to their folly. Use the biblical worldview. Use the scripture as the foundation. Number two, answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So once we've put ourselves again on that biblical worldview, we've made our solid argument, our defense from scripture, we want to show them, illustrate to them the foolishness of what it is they're arguing for. And also we want to expose to them that they don't live consistently with what they profess to believe. Um, so don't be afraid to ask them questions. We want to push back. And so ask them, okay, according to your view, what is it that makes a human being valuable? That what makes a, a human life worthy of being protected? Ask them that question. And most of the time you're going to hear something like, well, you know, human life is valuable and we know that, but the unborn child, they're totally dependent on their mother. If it wasn't for her, they wouldn't be able to survive for a second. They need her every step of the way. And so they're really not quite human. And then give them, give them the scenario, show them that, okay, if you applied that standard across the board, this is where you end up. So say something like this, that, okay, so a woman has an unplanned pregnancy and she decides to carry the term. She decides she's going to have the baby and she goes through with it, gives birth four weeks later, six weeks later, she realizes this is, she was not prepared. She wasn't equipped to have that child. She's not, she's not ready financially. She doesn't have the support she thought she would have. That child is going to have a rough life. She's having a hard time feeding herself, feeding the baby. Listen, that four week old baby completely dependent on the mother for everything, right? You leave that baby alone for a week. What's going to happen? Baby's going to die. That child is dependent on the mother and uh, it's impeding her happiness. They're, they're set for a hard life. And so is it okay then for that mother of that four week old child to put that child to death in order to have an easier life, in order to have that convenience? And why stop there? Who decides who's, uh, who's independent enough to, uh, to have a valuable life? Who is it that, get, that gets to make that determination? See, every single person is dependent on others to, from one degree to another. So what about elderly people in assisted living? Should we, is it okay just to euthanize them, to let them go? Or people who are relying on doctors or machines or medication or insulin or whatever it may be, is it okay because they're totally dependent on those things to, uh, to put them to death? Or what about people who are dependent on government support? Should we be able to execute them because they depend on the government to help them live? See, when you make it about dependence, the unborn child is not valuable because they're dependent on their mother to survive, then okay, let's take that out consistently. Do you see how this works? How you want to show them if you, they're consistent, this is where you get. Who makes that determination? See, their worldview can't possibly answer why human life is valuable. They can say that it is, and they will say that human life is, but they can't tell you why. And we have to show them that. See, and it shows also that they're living inconsistently because the things they do every single day, like go to the grocery store or uh, live with their parents or borrow money from a bank or whatever that may be, it shows that they're dependent on other people to one degree or another for their survival. And I'm sure they would consider their lives valuable. They wouldn't say that you would kill them because they're dependent. So we want to expose those inconsistencies in their worldview. 
And this is just one example of the abortion argument. You could do this with all the other arguments they throw, uh, they'll throw at you, saying that you know, the child is very small or whatever else it may be. But this is just the one example. They can't possibly answer why human life is valuable. See, too often, though, when we have a disagreement with somebody, when we're in these sorts of arguments, at least I know this, this is true for me, you kind of want to just like win the argument. You want to put them in their place. You want to show them and say, look, you don't know what you're talking about. We need to step back from that and be prayerful and remember what we talked about earlier, that apologetics and evangelism go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. The reason primarily at the foundation why we have these discussions, yeah, we want people to change their minds. We, would, you know, we want people to you know, vote pro-life or whatever, but that's not the main thing. We want people's hearts to be transformed because that's the place where when the Lord enters in and changes that person's heart, that's what changes everything else about them. That's what's going to make them value human life and change their perspective on things from the inside out. And we want people not only to affirm the lives of human beings, we want people secure for eternity, for their immortal soul. And so no matter what, you always want to make sure that you get to the gospel. Whatever it is that you're talking about, whatever you're defending, if it's abortion, you want to make sure that you get to the gospel because that's really what's important. And so you could do it something like this. Listen, being made in God's image, yes, it means that all of us are valuable. That's what gives every single human being value no matter what, but also it makes everybody accountable to God. And because we're made in God's image and God's our creator, we're responsible to obey God and none of us do. All of us are guilty before a holy God of sin and we are, we are owed punishment and not reward. God will punish all sin, but then we get into the gospel. He sent his only son to the world to live perfectly, to die in our place, was raised again on the third day. This is so important because so many times we'll just want to have the argument, we make our point, and we leave it at that. We can't do that. We need to make sure that we're preaching the gospel to people. That's the most important thing at the end of the day. Ultimately, that's what this is all about. There's another trap that we can fall into, though, when we do apologetics, and my dad hit on it earlier, that we're going to want to— Kind of like the knee-jerk reaction is to try to answer every single objection. They'll say something like, oh, I got an answer for that. Got an answer for that too. Listen, we want to defend our position. Absolutely. We are commanded to defend our faith, to make that defense. But we, it's not necessary that we defend every little minute argument they make against us, even if we can defend it. We don't have to do that. We need to stay focused on the main thing. So if you're talking about abortion, you need to stay focused on the main thing, which is the life of the unborn child, the personhood, and why that life is valuable. See, we can go off into these rabbit trails, and we want to just always make an answer. Listen, part of having a good defense is having good offense. And so, yes, we make our answer, but then make them make an answer as well. Don't let them off the hook. Ask them, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe your position? And listen, if we believe what the Bible says, remember that verse in Romans 1 where it says they are without excuse? We talked about the word apologia. The word for without excuse there is anapologetus. That means literally they are without a reason defense. The Bible tells us that the unbeliever, the person who denies God, literally does not have a defense. They have an indefensible position and so as Christians, we can be confident and know, listen, they're not, they'll try to give a defense. They might make something that might sound okay, but ultimately they will not give, be able to give a coherent defense of their position because it doesn't exist, says the Bible. So don't be afraid to push back a little bit. Always gentle, always like we talked about, tender-hearted, but tough-minded. Push back against them. Make sure that they give an answer for what they believe. Don't be afraid to ask them questions. Another example, and this is, along with abortion, this is the most important issue facing us as Christians today, and that's that of homosexuality. And again, I'm sure all of us have been involved and engaged in conversations regarding homosexuality. It's, it's such a hot topic right now. I mean, and we, we're seeing people professing Christians who are going off and supporting it and saying it's all right. We need to know what we're going to say um, when that issue comes up. And you guys, again, you've heard the, the accusations. 
Christians are bigoted. Christians are so small-minded. You guys are so intolerant. You guys are so unloving. Why do you care? What, what difference does it make to you who someone loves? Why do you want to worship a God who condemns people based on who they love? Isn't love love? Why do you want everyone to be just like you? We've heard those arguments supporting homosexuality. Oh, it's not your business. You're so judgmental. Why do you care? All that. You can't control them. Again, just take a step back. Think about, okay, what are the worldview? What, is the, what are the presuppositions? What are they assuming? So they assume a couple things when they're arguing for homosexuality. Again, it makes the individual the authority. Personal preference determines right relationships. So it's all about what the person feels is right for them. It's an atheistic worldview. It denies God. It denies God's authority, ultimately. So they, they're, they're arguing that whatever a person feels is right, that's okay. That's what determines a good and right relationship. As opposed to the biblical worldview that God, as our creator, is the one and the only one who can determine which relationships are right and which are sinful. And so again, they'll give the same sorts of arguments. Listen, don't force your religion on me. Don't care what the Bible says. And the temptation for us every time, I keep repeating this because it's important, because we're always going to be tempted to do this, is to put away the Bible. We're going to say, okay, listen, I just want them to listen to me. And so if it means giving up scripture, then fine. And so we'll go and we'll talk about, say, well, listen, if we look back in history, you know, Marriage has the norm for marriage is always between men and women. You know, homosexuality has never really been a societal norm the way it is today. Or we can say that there's no actual genetic or biological evidence that people really are born homosexual. And we can use that evidence and that may be okay, but they'll have those rescuing devices. We talked about that. So they'll answer you and they'll say, oh, pfft. Who cares about what societies in the past did? We're evolving. We can't look. You want to revert back to the past? We're progressing. We don't want to go back to the old ways. We're making progress. Or they'll say, well, maybe there's no biological evidence, but we just haven't found it yet. There, we know. We know that people are born homosexual. We just haven't found the evidence yet. They'll have a rescuing device. They'll have an answer for the evidence, no matter how strong it may be. And so that can't be the foundation of our argument. No matter how tempting it may be to, you know, separate ourselves from scripture a little bit because we don't want them to think that we're weirdos or whatever. We need to stand on the Bible. Our approach has to be from scripture, the ultimate standard for all mankind. And so we reject their assumption. Number one, don't answer according to their folly. We reject that presupposition that it's the individual preference that's final authority. Instead, we affirm that the Bible teaches that God made man in his own image, that God ordained marriage as being between one man and one woman, and sex is to happen in that context and in that context only. We affirm also that this is for his glory. The, re the reason he ordained things this way is for his glory and for the good of mankind. It's good for human flourishing. We procreate. We have that, uh, that oneness and that intimacy between just that one other person who is of the opposite sex. They're made for one another. And then, yes, of course, we can use the biological evidence on top of that. Like, look, male, female, they're made for each other. They fit together naturally. It produces life. Unlike male, male or female, female, that can't work. It doesn't promote human flourishing. It leads ultimately to death. We base our argument on scripture that calls homosexuality an abomination and tells us that those who practice it do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is our foundation. This is why ultimately we believe what we believe. So that's number one. Don't answer according to their folly. Don't take their worldview as your own. Number two, answer them according to their folly. Show them where this leads, okay? So let me ask you guys, and you guys can answer if you know the question. If you know the answer, you can shout it out. Um, what is like the big stipulation placed on sex by the secular world? What's the one thing you need? Consent. Consent. Yes, that's everything. To the unbeliever, to the secular world, consent is everything, and it's the only thing. If you don't have consent, then sex is immoral. It's morally wrong apart from consent, they say. And we agree with that, of course, but they believe that's the only thing it takes. That no matter who, where, when, how many, what gender, whatever, it's all good as long as everybody involved is okay with what's happening. As long as everybody gives their consent, you can do whatever you want. But if you don't have consent, no. It's completely morally wrong. 
And so ask them the question, okay. And it's almost like, I've prayed a lot. It's hard to talk about some of these things, but we have to. We have to be tough-minded. So this is an example of being tough-minded when we talk about these things. Ask them a question. Okay, so what if somebody comes up to you and says, listen, all my life I've felt this way. This feels right to me. I am sexually attracted to my sibling and she feels the same way and we feel so fulfilled in that and it's just a wonderful consensual sexual relationship and this is the only way that I feel I can express my sexuality. And so who are you to say that that's not okay? Or who's the state to say that, that they shouldn't be allowed to get married? Why can't you marry your sibling or your cousin or your aunt or uncle? If as long as it's consensual, as long as, you know, they're not hurting anybody. They're not doing any harm, right? There's consent, so why not? Or if somebody asks, tells you that for their whole life, there's a, what about a 40-year-old man who's in a consensual sexual relationship with a 14-year-old boy? And both of them are okay with it. Both of them are happy with it. Both of them are, you know, uh, they feel fulfilled by it. So who's society? Why should society condemn that? Why should the government say that's illegal? It's consensual. They're making those decisions. They're not hurting anybody. Why, can, why should you be allowed to deny them fulfilling these desires? Again, this is, it's hard to stand up here and talk about this stuff, let alone to go out there and say these things to people who are supportive of homosexuality. But this is where we talk. We have to be tough-minded because this is, if they're consistent and you say that consent is the only thing you need to have a right sexual relationship and all the rest is individual preference, that's where it leads. This is where it goes. We're just showing them that we're applying their view consistently. And we can even take it a step further. Why consent in the first place? Where do you get consent from, unbeliever? Is it because you prefer it? But what if another person prefers rape? What if consent's not important to somebody else? They don't see that as being something that they care about. What's wrong with that? In fact, if they're coming at you from an atheistic worldview, an evolutionary worldview, where they believe that we're just the product of random chance mutations, that we're genetic accidents, that, there's a fly, um, that, um, that our, whole, our whole goal as a species is to propagate, to pass on our genetics, to evolve and to thrive and to, um, uh, to reproduce, and if we're, there's no ultimate purpose or meaning in the universe, then what's the difference? Rape, according to that evolutionary worldview, actually would be a good thing because that's probably the most efficient way to reproduce and to propagate the species. Who cares if somebody doesn't prefer it? Because that's all they have. At the end of the day, all they have is personal preference. They can't appeal to a higher authority. They say consent. Okay, why? Because you like it? Why should anybody care about what you prefer? Again, it's hard to say, but we have to illustrate to them the foolishness of what they're arguing for because the worldview that celebrates homosexuality is the same worldview that if you carry it out consistently would celebrate incest, pedophilia, and rape. That's just being consistent. I hope you guys see that. But again, we never leave people in that place where you kind of, you throw all this at them and they don't know what to say. You never leave them there. We always have to remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we are uh, striving towards. We want them to hear the good news of Christ. And so, yes, the Bible does say that those who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. But guess what? It said, neither will the greedy or the swindlers or the drunkards or revilers or thieves or sexually immoral, idolatrous, sorcerers, and so on. The point is, all of us are guilty before God. No matter what our sin is, all of us have sinned. We're guilty before God. We're all condemned. But God did something about that. And we get into the gospel. That's where we have to end up. Every time, don't get caught up in winning the argument. Make sure you remember who you're talking to. It's not just some sort of opponent. This is a human being made in God's image who's on their way to eternity and hell apart from Christ. We should, our goal is to reach them with the gospel while defending our position, while defending the faith. See, as Christians, and we show them also the biblical worldview actually is consistent. It works. See, as Christians, we can give an answer for consent. We can tell them why consent is actually, you know, unconsensual sex is sinful. Since man is made in God's image and God ordained sex as being between in those, uh, in the most deeply intimate, precious, loving relationships, when we violate that institution and we violate that individual, um, that's a gross, 
horrific sin. It's a violation of the image of God and of God's institution. And so we can rightly condemn rape and unconsensual sexual relations, but we can only do that in the biblical worldview. We can only do that by understanding what the Bible teaches about God, about man, about sex, about sin. See, our worldview makes sense of those things. It can explain why things are the way they are. The unbiblical worldview can't do it. It's important for us also to understand because we can get carried away. We're not here to, you know, to poke holes in people's worldview. Here's the thing. The holes are already there. We're not here to kind of blow things up. It implodes. It, it ruins itself from the inside. We're just here to point out to them the holes that are already there. Okay? That's important for us to understand. Let me give it Are we still good on time? What time is it? Oh, you yeah, have plenty of time. All right. Let me give you guys another example. Because um, this is another one that is big for us right now as Christians. It's a big objection that we hear a lot of. And that's that of, how many of you guys have heard this? Have you guys ever even read the Old Testament, Christian? Do you see what God does in the Old Testament? God is so mean. He's so mean-spirited. He's vindictive and spiteful and he's judgmental and just, you know, he's, he's commanding genocide. He's telling them to go out and to kill people. Is that the God you worship? Really? Listen, if I'm going to worship God, it's definitely not going to be that God. That's a mean-spirited, you know, nasty God. You guys have heard that one, right? Once again, don't get flustered. Don't get thrown off. Think about what it is they're assuming. So they don't believe in God, right? It's an atheistic worldview. They're making an argument against God. And their thing is the individual, they themselves, the one who set the standard for justice. Do you guys see a pattern there? All those unchristian presuppositions, it's all about the individual. They determine what's right sexual relations. They determine who's valuable. They determine what justice is. For us, the Christians, we say that God is the standard for justice for all people at all times. See, what they're arguing is God doesn't exist, and the reason they give is that he doesn't meet their standard of justice and righteousness. Listen, God doesn't measure up to what I think God should be. That's what they're saying when they make that argument. And so what's our, what's our knee-jerk reaction as Christians? You hear it so much. It's more like, oh, yeah, well, you know, the Old Testament, that's not really for us, and maybe God was a little harsh, and, but we have Jesus now, and Jesus preaches love, and Jesus loves everybody. Listen, that does not, that's an unbiblical defense. The Bible does not teach us to leave, listen, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. So if you love Jesus, you love that God, right? So we need to be able to give an answer to this objection. So first of all, number one, don't answer according to their folly. Don't take on their worldview. Listen, they are not the standard of justice and we can't let them think that they're the standard of justice. We can't let them go on believing that what they think is just, what they think is righteous is in, is in fact just in righteousness. The Bible teaches us that God is perfectly just, perfectly righteous, and perfectly good, that he's never vindictive, that he never punishes harshly, he never punishes people beyond what they deserve, and in fact, God is patient and gracious with all people, and we in this life get less, much less suffering than we deserve from God, much less punishment than we deserve, much less discipline, I should say. The Bible also teaches us that all sin deserves to be punished. And since God is holy, all sin must be punished. And then when we get into that Old Testament, listen, you know, we need to know what we believe as Christians. And so during that time, what they're referring to in the Old Testament, God was using Israel, the people of Israel, those people at that time and that place specifically in history to bring out his just judgments on those nations that practiced idolatry, that practiced sexual immorality, that practiced child sacrifice, that God was using Israel during that time to righteously judge those people. It was just. And we need to be able to articulate that as Christians. Like, look, what you're referring to, that was justice. They did not get what they didn't deserve. Now, that being said, as New Testament Christians, we can say that, you know, what Jesus' words, you know, that, uh, Jesus teaches us to love and pray for our enemies. He tells us not to live by the sword or else we'll die by the sword. But also we're taught that, guess what? The world is already condemned for rejecting Christ Jesus, for rejecting God. And when Jesus returns, he is going to come back in judgment 
the way that that Old Testament stuff portrays. That, that stuff in the Old Testament should serve as a warning to us today that when God comes back, he's coming back to judge justly. And so anybody who would take that scripture and twist it and use it as an excuse to commit genocide today, they are absolutely unbiblically twisting the word of God. That's not a Christian worldview. However, the Christian worldview does teach us that the judgment is coming and it's the one man whom God has appointed to judge, not us. So tell them that the Bible does not support genocide. It tells us about God's justice but it doesn't tell us that we're to go out and kill people. That's absolutely not what the Bible teaches us today. So that's number one. Don't answer according to their folly. You give your defense on scripture, biblical worldview, but then answer. Again, you want to ask those why questions, the big questions. Force them to defend themselves. So okay, say, okay, but according to your view, what's wrong with genocide? Why is that a problem? Why is it unjust to kill other people? And again, you can use that atheistic worldview. If they're arguing, saying that God does not exist, that we're the products of evolution, say, okay, your worldview says that survival of the fittest, right? That we're to, you know, we want to survive and thrive our people group. And so what's wrong then if there's one group that occupies a certain land and, and it would be better for my group? Why can't we just go kill them and take that land? What's morally wrong with that? Or if somebody has something that I want that's going to be helpful for me, why can't I get rid of them and take it for myself. Or if there's a people group who I'm, or who my group is able to enslave and it makes my life easier, my life better. And if they don't have the power to rise up against it and rebel and free themselves, then, Hey, survival of the fittest, man, what's wrong with that? Morally, no problem. Or if somebody says that there's a certain group that is the root cause of all the problems in our society, why can't we just exterminate them? It's going to help us make our lives better. See, and that's exactly the logic and the reasoning that was used for things like slavery and the Holocaust. That's the worldview that led to those atrocities. But what's wrong with that? They can't, they can't give you a good moral reason why those things are wrong all the time in every place. See, as the Christian, we can answer those big why questions. We can say, again, God is the objective standard of justice. He's made people in his image. He's commanded us not to murder and not to steal, that we respect other people and their property. And violating these things are sinful and they're unjust because they go against the just character of God. Do you guys see how this works? How we get there? How we show them? Now listen, if you applied your standard that you are the authority of justice, why should that be binding for anybody else? You apply that consistently, what difference does it make? <clears throat> why is that wrong? But again, I always want to make sure that you guys know and remember, we get to the gospel that yes, God is just. And being just, he provides for us a perfect standard for justice for all people at all times. But God being just also means that he punishes all sin. He has to. And since all of us are, are sinners, all of us have treated people unjustly, all of us have stolen, all of us have violated God's justice, we're guilty of sin and deserving of punishment. But and then you go on and you preach to them the good news of Christ Jesus. And remember that inconsistency that my dad mentioned, like with the nurse and the mafia and all that kind of stuff. That when they show, you know, with the doctors and nurses, when they're operating on people and they're striving to save lives, it shows that they're made in God's image. The same is true for this issue of justice. So every time you see somebody who's not a Christian outraged over some sort of injustice, when they're just irate about a mass shooting or they're grieving over injustices and, um, and, and things such as that, it shows that they're made in the image of God. Because listen, if you don't believe in God, what difference does it make if there's a mass shooting? Who cares? It's just, we're just evolved pond scum. We're nothing. Ultimately, the universe is purposeless. See, they're acting contrary to what they say they believe. They say on the one side, God doesn't exist. We're not made in God's image. And then on the other side, they're upset about injustice, or, you know, thievery and things like that, murder. Why? It shows that they're made in the image of God. They can't escape it. And we need to point that out to them. We need to get to the place where we can point out that inconsistency in their living. That you say you believe this, but you're living like this. That's a Christian presupposition. That's a Christian worldview. One last important thing to remember. I'm just about done. Um, what we're talking about here this morning, this isn't a script for us to memorize. I know that I've given you guys like scenarios and you might want to think about saying this. 
Every conversation you have is going to be a little bit different. People are going to ask different questions. They're going to say things you might not have thought about. This is not a script for us to memorize, but I want us to really be thinking in this way. Like we talked about taking every thought captive that we want to look at. And when we watch the news, when we watch a movie, when we hear things, think about the worldviews, think about the presuppositions. What would you say to that person? And what will you say when people do press you for an answer? I want us to, um, to understand that this is like our framework for thinking, but this is not, you know, the answer. This isn't some sort of like philosophical shortcut that's going to uh, help us. Let me back up. <laughs> we want to steer conversations in this sort of direction. Absolutely. But this is not a philosophical shortcut that gets us off the hook from knowing scripture. And I want to leave you guys with this because this is a big conviction of mine. Every time... I do apologetics. Every time I have to prepare for something like this, I'm so convicted because I don't know the word of God well enough. And what I want to press on you guys is that you can understand this approach. You can understand this method. You can understand philosophy and apologetics and logic and whatever. But if you don't know the Bible, then you're not going to be effective. More than anything, I want you guys to leave here committed to knowing the word of God, to knowing what the Bible teaches. We need to know how to explain and articulate the gospel, God, man, sin, justification, the Trinity. Those are going to help us. Those are going to go so far in doing evangelism and apologetics. That's the foundation. We need to know first and foremost what we actually believe before we go and defend it. So I want to leave you guys with that. Yes, this method, this approach to apologetics is important. And I do believe this is the most biblical approach to doing apologetics, but it's no substitute for knowing and understanding scripture. And I pray that you guys um, are truly committed to taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, to knowing the Bible, knowing what it teaches, and being able to articulate that.